Next up, we have photographer David LaChapelle. Yeah, David LaChapelle in the house. David started out as a photographer at 17 years old, and he worked for Andy Warhol's Interview magazine. Like, how incredible is that? His images have appeared on the covers and pages of magazines, including GQ, the New York Times Magazine, Vanity Fair, and Rolling Stone. In the last decade, David's work has been shown in prestigious museums, including the Musée d'Orsay and the National Gallery. Please join me in welcoming David LaChapelle. Hello. Um, wow, it's uh, really nice to be here. Thank you uh, for coming out. Talking about inspiration and where it comes from, and I think inspiration can come from many different places. It comes from one source, I believe, a, a higher consciousness. But it, it can be instilled in you and provoked in you in all kinds of circumstances, and having uh, started really young in photography. I've created under all different types of circumstances in my life and had to create through those. Um, when, when my mom uh, met my dad, she came to, uh, she was in America for three days and uh, met my dad working in tobacco in Connecticut, picking tobacco. My dad was putting himself through college and she used to do these photos, set up these elaborate tableaus um, on weekends when she had time off from work and raising us kids, she would set up these tableaus. That's me, the baby of the family. And she made these little wings out of paper. And this got more and more elaborate as, I, as we grew up. And we, she was creating this sort of, as an immigrant coming from, from war-torn Eastern Europe, uh, from camps and, and all this, you know, the horrors of war, she came to America with this idea of uh, this American dream, this aspirational idea of what it should look like. And sometimes she would take us and put us in knee socks. Everything was like every weekend. Knee socks and turtlenecks. And we, you know, we hated it, but we, had, we did it because it was mom's thing. It was her aspirational idea of, of, the, of, the, of the American dream. And that's not our dog, and that's not... I don't know what country club that is, but we didn't belong to it. Um, and we didn't dress like that either, but that was picture day. And <laughs> so she had these albums and albums of books, and when she passed away, we were looking through all these pictures, and I saw the angel of me as a baby, and I'd forgotten all about it. Uh, at 15, I dropped out of school because I was getting bullied, and... Uh, wound up in New York City with my friends, and uh, there I was in the East Village. There's me at 14 or 15 in the Bowery, uh, probably places I shouldn't have been. And, uh, but I was, you know, I somehow made it through all that, and uh, the East Village was incredible. I mean, there were artists, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, I'd go to their openings. I, I, you know, the gallery scene, the music scene, dancing. We went out to dance, and You'd see all your artist friends, and it was, uh, nobody cared where you came from, nobody cared your sexuality, nobody cared how much money you had, that was all besides the point. And if you cared about those things, you didn't belong. It was all about what you could bring to the party, if you're a cool artist, if you could make someone laugh, if you could dance good, what you were wearing, that's what mattered. <laughs> and the East Village was this utopia, this sort of heaven. Um, and then AIDS came. And my friends started dying. I'm 17, 18 years old, and they didn't have a name for this disease at the time. And I joined this group called ACT UP. And that picture, uh, this AP photo, that's me in the denim jacket. And that was on the cover of the Hartford Current. And my mom was at the dentist's office, and she saw this picture. And, um, you know, she really knew that I was fighting for my life and for the life of my friends. And everybody was 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 dying, you know, and these young people, and I, my questions in my mind were, where, where are they going? Where's their soul going? Where, where is the 23-year-old who's vital and full of energy, making art one week and the next week 
on this deathbed and then dies, where does that go? These questions, these metaphysical questions that I really needed to answer, also the fear and the horror of this crisis, really that, that inspired me to make this bunch of pictures. And, and I think that the ancients had it right, with the winged figure. So this is analog. This is 1985. Um, so even then, you know, I had these wings. I had saved some money working in nightclubs, and I had these wings made. I found this guy that could make these wings. I designed them because I needed them to look like they could lift somebody off the ground. I really wanted them to have weight and muscle. And, and, uh, and these, these, oh, yeah, going back, there's my mom's little paper wings. I didn't put the two together until till many, many years later. But um, I started trying to figure out, you know, uh, to photograph the unphotographable, to, to answer these metaphysical questions, these questions of, uh, I've always been a very spiritual kid. My, my mom found God in nature. My dad was um, Catholic, and I went to church with him. And as I got older, I really learned the beauty of the rituals and the stained glass and the, the, the artisans that made the churches that really always in, impressed me and intrigued me. I saw the beauty in that. So together I had my mom, whose cathedral was the forest, and my dad, who went to the cathedral, and his father, his brother's a priest. Um, my mother called him Holy Hector, the money collector. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, that's another story. Every family has its stories, right? Um, so I was, I was creating these images out of, out of an escape, and what that, creating them gave me the sense of, doing something, you know, I, I didn't, it wasn't about leaving a legacy, it wasn't about, oh, I want to, you know, leave a mark behind, I actually just wanted to have a purpose for having been alive, I thought I was going to die too, so I th didn't think I was going to live past 24, I just had this number in my head, because that's how old my boyfriend was when he died, I was 21, he was 24, so I got in my head, I'm not going to live past 24, so I want to get some beautiful pictures out in the world before that happens, so I started making these images, first in black and white, then in color, and they were all like about these you know, spiritual questions and um, ideas of heaven, ideas of, of uh, immortality, ideas of, of the soul, and what does that look like? Um, cutting negatives and painting them with dyes. Uh, and then having gallery shows at my friend's apartment in New York City, uh, which is now a successful gallery. This pushed my friend um, Jeffrey, you know, and it's sort of like the the sadness of that time, too. There was such sorrow in losing so many, so many people, and you couldn't even mourn them properly because you were so scared of dying yourself. You know, so my mom was creating out of this aspiration to create images of, a, of this idea of this, uh, you know, American family, her idea of, of, the, of America. I was creating at that point out of uh, a, a way to put my energy out of the fear and out of the the pain and into something I could give to the world and have it, to have a purpose for to be alive. Um, and as I then I started working for Interview Magazine and and now the, Andy Warhol was my favorite artist and I got to the, this was a, the last portrait taken of Andy before he died. I had worked for Andy for a couple years be, prior to this photo, and he told me do whatever you want, just make everyone look good. And so. This opened up a world of magazines to me, which I had not really considered because I was showing in galleries, and I started photographing celebrities of pop culture and fashion. And, and around this time, I found that I wasn't dying of AIDS. I didn't have it. So I, kind of a boulder rolled off my shoulders, and I started really having a blast and, and making aspirational, funny photographs, pictures that were just, you know, their only purpose was... Uh, was beauty. The only purpose was escapism. The, the purpose was, was uh, sometimes just humorous. Um, and then things, as I got older and working with magazines for 20 years, I, I started thinking differently about, um, about life, as one does, I think, as you get older. And, I, and, and following that, you know, following that inner voice that tells you, okay, now I should be doing this, and not letting the editors or other people or whoever it might be tell you, well, we want what you did last year. We want what you did the year before that. You know, just staying true to what's going to excite you. I always imagine a blank piece of paper. What can I put on that? I put anything I want. 
Well, I want to create something that's going to just take people away and make them dream like music does. That music has that power to touch us. And I always aspired for my photos to be like music and to touch the heart directly. And that didn't mean doing what I already had done. I wanted to do pictures I hadn't seen yet. I wanted people to, I wanted to share those photos so people would see pictures that they hadn't seen yet. I wanted to blow people's minds. I wanted to be the pictures in the magazine that got ripped out and put on the fridge. And so the refrigerator became the museum and the magazine became the gallery for me. And if it, my picture got ripped out and put on someone's fridge, then it had made it to the museum. And uh, that was the goal, you know? And, uh, and then as I got older, my, my working in magazines, my pictures took on a different uh, weight. And I started wanting to do series of images that, uh, you know, I showed all the clothes, but the editors were like, what are you doing? And this picture was taken 30 years ago. Or, or this is, sorry, this is 1999. So this is 20 years ago. I was thinking about all this plastic that we're using. Where is it going to go? Um, so social things started creeping into my photographs. Um, this is 10 years before that. This was a exhibition Kenny Scharf put on in the East Village, and Keith Haring was in the show, and, and many artists, uh, um, Sherry Levine, just great, great artists of, of, that, of the 80s. And so in 1989, it was called Don't Bunk of the Jungle. Kenny was living in Brazil, and he was talking about the fires in Brazil. And, and we were all raising all the proceeds of this group show, the Tony Jafrazi Gallery. It all went to, to help save the rainforest. Now, that was 30 years ago. We didn't have any idea what would be happening today. I didn't have any idea I'd be living in a rainforest today. But, um, you know, artists always kind of had this prophetic nature. And, and Kenny certainly was ahead arranging this, uh, this gallery exhibition. You know, and you can you always look at the artists. The artists, you know, really know something many times before before others know. And I, I listen to the music of Stevie Wonder a lot. And the songs in the key of life sort of, you know, is it, like prophecy for the times we live in today. And jumping ahead a little bit, I, I recently collaborated with Travis Scott and did his, uh, his Astro World cover. And I was, I was at the time working on my last books and I was just listening two years straight to songs in the key of life over and over and over again. And Travis came to the studio and I was like, you know, Songs in the Key of Life is the most important recording in the 20th century. And I was just going on and on about it. And he wound up calling Stevie to play harmonica on Astro World. And that was just a really great exchange, how artists can, like, work together and just breathe and relax. So that's another way inspiration comes, from collaboration and, and not working out of fear of, of, of dying and not working out of aspiration, but just working out of sheer... Uh, joy of, of, of making things, of, of, of creating, you know, an image to go with someone's music. And, you know, Travis trusted me so much, I made him drawings, and I didn't even have to, uh, he didn't even show up at the, at the photo shoot, he was at a basketball game. And, uh, you know, I had really, there's a, uh, this is a series that I started called uh, People I Wanted to Photograph, I didn't get a chance to. And there's George Harrison and Stevie Wonder <laughs> um, shot, in, shot where I live in, in Hawaii. Well, I did, towards the end of my magazine career, let's say, I, I started doing pictures that were becoming more challenging for the editors. I did this one series, uh, Jesus is My Homeboy. And if you really want to get, uh, hear silence on the end of a phone, <laughs> talk... <laughs> Talk to a British fashion editor who's really excited about you doing another shoot for them for free. And what is it? What's it going to be this time, David? And, well, I want to do Jesus, my homeboy. Like, you know, shocking. You can't, really can't shock people today. But talk about Jesus, and it's like, especially if you're white, it's like, oh. One of them. Um, but I wanted to see what that would look like if Jesus had come back, like what his disciples would look like. And I made sure I put lots of credits in there. So I had Nike, Puma, like, so the magazine would be like, okay, well, we got our, these are all our advertisers. And um, 
they ran the photos. But I, get, I started getting this small voice in the back of my head, dude, it's time to move on. You've time to move on. You've got to you know, leave this world of magazines and move on to something else. And I didn't know what that was. And then I really know that I was kind of finished. I did this series, uh, House at the End of the World. This is the last story I did for magazines. Um, and it was about hurricanes and uh, the destruction of, of climate change. And this is, uh, this, this is shot in, in, in the spring. And when it was on the newsstand three months later, Katrina happened and people were phoning Italian Vogue upset because they thought that I had like seen the images of Katrina and done a, a, a fashion shoot about it and they thought that I was exploiting a tragedy and, and the images were shot you know, three months prior but they just happened to be on the newsstand. And I knew then I had to leave the world of magazines that my pictures were not coinciding with the, the needs of the magazine. The editor called me from Italy, David, why uh, the pictures? And you look at people calling the magazine, they think it's about the hurricane. And I said, it is about hurricanes. You know, I just didn't know, I didn't know Katrina was gonna happen, but you know, I was leaving my mom's house in Florida and they were putting up the, the hurricane shutters and, and I couldn't do anything about it, I felt so helpless. So I was always doing what was on my mind and letting that come out in, in the images. Um, so, you know, inspiration can come from, from anywhere. And, and I think the most important thing what I want to leave you with is, uh, you know, I love photographs. They, they stop time. I think that's, that's, that's another thing I love about them. But the thing I want to leave you most with today is that, is that inspiration can come from pain. It can come from loss. It can come from solitude. And, and I think that you need solitude. And we have, always have our devices with us. And I spent so much time in the woods as a kid by myself when when everyone was dying of AIDS, I would go out in the woods and I'd pray and I'd be like, oh, you know, just how do I get through this? And I would receive direction, I would receive comfort, I would receive inspiration for, for photos. And I would go ahead and do that and I would, I'd make, but you have to turn your devices off. You have to let solitude, because it's a small voice and you'll miss it. It was that same voice that told me to leave magazines and move uh, away. Go, and when I was young, I prayed for a cabin in the woods, because that's where I'd be closer to God and be able to afford uh, to, to take care of myself off of t photography. And I wanted to be able to support myself as a photographer. And this was back in the East Village. That was my, my prayer, you know, and to be able to afford vegetarian food at Angelica's Kitchen, this restaurant in New York, which is <laughs> veg just closed now. But. And those things came to pass. And I, and I got my cabin in the woods in, in Hawaii, and I create from there now. And I didn't know, I thought I was leaving photography, and yet going there, following that voice, brought me to a place which has inspired me for the last 10 years, just epic nature and putting figures in that nature uh, and letting that be the background instead of building sets, finding sets. And I'll leave you on this image. Um, I think it's one of my favorite things that I've done um, in, in the last few years. You know, and, and I just want to tell you that, you know, make that quiet time, make that space um, where you're away from your friends, away from everybody, because we have all the answers inside of us when it comes to creative things. W ask yourself not what you're going to get, you know, from a career in photography or a career in art direction, or, but what, what are you going to give? And that's what I always did from when I was really young was, what can I give the world that, they, that, that, that would ease, ease, ease the pain of the world or, or bring some joy or touch people in some way or, or bring a smile to their face or some color? And, and I did that. I, I, I was always asking what I can give. I never thought about being famous or being a lifestyle. I wanted to take photos that were famous, that were, people would see. I didn't want to sing in the shower. You know, but I, wanted, I really wanted to give something, not, not what I was going to get. I talked to a lot of students, and I always tell them, you know, what are you going to, what are you going to give the world that, that in the, as far as imagery goes, as far as being an artist, you know, you can create darkness and more confusion and more things that nobody understands, or you can create something that's, you know, enlightened and, and can touch people, or you can attempt to do that, you know, and that's, and that's what I try to do, and, and make that quiet space so you can hear that voice, which is your GPS. As an artist, we don't have, you know, a, a guide like being a lawyer, you know, do good in this this class and go to this college and intern at this law, law firm. You know, artists, I would have never, could have never planned this journey that would have taken me from galleries to magazines to, to 
to the island of Hawaii, unless I'd followed that voice and made that quiet time, I could hear it, you know, so, so turn your stuff off, turn off your devices and, and listen and, um, and let life inspire you, whatever you're going through. Thank you so much. Have a good day.